hi everyone. Uh, my name is Felix. I'm a research, re research assistant at um, KIT, so formerly a University of Karlsruhe in Karlsruhe, in Germany. And today I'm going to talk about bringing transmit antenna diversity to low power wide area networks. And I want to talk specifically about what we at KIT try to, to, to uh, improve low power wide area file layers um, yeah, and how we implemented that in radio. So I'll start with a very short introduction into LP1s. Before I go into sparse, which is the waveform we're proposing, um, I go over the idea, how we got to that, how it works, and how we finally implemented a transceiver system. Um, I have some over-the-air verific verification results for you from that, and at the end, of course, there will be a summary. So low-power wide area networks, or LP1s, that is basically a relatively, relatively recent uh, network paradigm that has arisen to cater applications that do not need ever higher data rates or um, five nines of reliability or sub-millisecond um, latency, but what, would, what they need is actually great range and penetration. Um, those networks are usually sensor networks. Um, and another challenge you have there are the very strict power, size, and complexity constraints. The devices need to be cheap, they need to be small, and they are supposed to run off a single battery for like at least five, often 10, maybe even 15 years without any maintenance if possible. Um, so what's the use case for that? The most popular use case is probably everything that is connected to smart cities, or at least some of the business cases there, such as smart lighting, where you have, for instance, uh, smart street lamps or street poles that potentially also have environmental sensors mon uh, mounted on them, smart mobility, so traffic monitoring, parking spot monitoring, or also maybe you want to monitor the fill status of your intelligent and smart public trash bin to optimize your garbage collection route. Um, IoT, smart cities, and also LP1s have been a pretty hot topic over the past years, and several commercial uh, manufacturers now have pushed their solutions to the problem onto the market and are trying to grab their market shares. Um, therefore, also, the, the technology landscape is really diverse. There's a lot of different pr approaches for basically the same um, problem. We have very narrow band systems. You may, might have heard of Sigfox. Wide band systems, LoRa. We have licensed spectrum access. Uh, as in the case of narrowband IoT, or unlicensed spectrum access, which is what basically everyone else does. Um, also, in terms of frequencies, there's different approaches. Most actually use sub-gigahertz frequencies, which kind of makes sense, because you want to cover large distances, and lower frequencies get, give you a lower propagation loss. But some actually use the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. So you might ask, why would you do that if you have higher propagation loss? Well, actually, there's a few points that are in favor of the 2.4 gigahertz band. First of all, worldwide availability. Think of a tracking application that needs to work um, in the US, in Europe, um, or in Asia. Not so easy in the sub gigahertz band. Those are just not the same everywhere. You have no duty cycle restrictions. That kind of hurts base stations. Because if you want to acknowledge every packet that's coming to ensure a certain quality of service, you sometimes simply can't because you have like a 1% duty cycle. Um, then you have 80 megahertz of bandwidth. Admittedly, most of that, or at least a large portion of that, will probably be occupied by Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other technologies. But even if you just have a small fraction of that, that's enough to set up a LP1. And if you're clever about it and find the holes in the, let's say, time frequency plane, you can really make the most out of it. But what's also really interesting about the 2.4 gigahertz band is that we have a lower wavelength. The wavelength, or lambda half, in this case, is about six to six and a half centimeters. So it actually becomes viable to mount a second antenna onto your sensor, which is also being done by commercial vendors already. They usually do this to, to uh, combat multipath fading and then implement something like switch combining. Um, and that was also the point where we at KT said, well, if you already have two antennas mounted or a sensor 
and we're using them for reception, why don't we use them for transmission? So that is basically the idea. We have resources that we can use, um, and we can further increase our resistance to multipath fading um, through transmit antenna diversity if we find a clever modulation scheme that actually can make use of that. But, of course, uh, constraints. Um, we should not use any, or at least as few as possible, additional resources. So no additional energy that would shorten our battery life. We don't want the sensor to become larger. And of course, it's, it's not supposed to become more expensive. Um, before I got into low power wide area networks, um, I was interested in spatial modulation, actually. And I remembered that I had once come across um, a um, proposal of a waveform that was called Differential Full Diversity Spatial Modulation. Um, and that is actually pretty interesting in this case because it's basically a two by two, so two antennas, two time slots, um, differential space time block code, so like Alamuti, you could say, for, uh, for the dimensions. You have very simple modulation and also simple demodulation where ML is feasible. Um, and then that is the performance gain for independent fading channels, which is, of course, an assumption, um, you can get a, tr um, a transmit diversity order of two. And, and that is the point where it becomes feasible for LP ones. Is, um, it's basically a spatial modulation derivative. So one of the key features there is you only activate one antenna at a time. So that means you don't need a second RF chain. You just need a very inexpensive switch in front of the antenna. So and this is where the idea for sparse had been born, which is short for spatial modulation for long-range sensor networks, and also much quicker to pronounce. Um, OK, so modulation scheme alone doesn't make a system that you can try over the air. So we decided to build upon something that we already know and have and have implemented. And if you've been to the last GRCon, you might remember that I presented on that. So that is the IEEE 802.15.4 Low Energy Critical Infrastructure Monitoring Direct Sequence Spread Spectrum Physical Layer. Um, that one has been standardized in cooperation with Ingenue, who commercialized it under the name of Random Face Multiple Access, or RPMA. Um, as I said, we implemented that uh, at our lab under, under the name of GR, uh, in an out of free module called GRLP1, which is available online. Um, the key features are basically you have a very short payload size of up to 32 bytes, um, you have a convolutional forward error correction, and you have a, as I said, it's a, it's a spreading system with really high spreading factors of up to two to the power 15, which is 45 dB of spreading gain, which you need to cover those large distances. So the main change we did actually is we ripped out the original modulation, which had been dBPSK or OQPSK, and replaced it with FDDSM. Um, if you just look at the simul uh, uh, simulated error curves in independent block, Rayleigh block fading, you actually see that FDDSM outperforms dbpsk with those settings here um, at a packet error rate of 1%, which is usually like the target, by about 9 dB, which is about the additional loss you have um, in free space um, due to the shorter wavelength. So how does this FDDSM work? It's basically pretty easy. You have this space-time block code, which is a two-by-two two matrix. It's differential, so it's multiplied with the previous one. Um, so on this S is the data-carrying matrix, which itself consists out of two matrices, AQ and BL. And Q and L are basically chosen depending on the bits you want to send. A is also simple. It's either simply the identity matrix or it's a permutation matrix with an additional phase shift. So it basically controls in which order the antennas are turned on. Um, and V is, um, again, a diagonal matrix with some PSK-like constellation symbols on, uh, on the main di diagonal. L, U1, U2, and phi are the sign parameters. You can control the spectral efficiency um, and optimize the bit or uh, block error rate performance at a receiver. Demodulation, as I said, simply maximum likelihood. But usually we don't want hard decision like this. We want soft bits, so we calculate approximate log likelihood ratios bitwise, which is really simple. And if you assume the same SNR, 
for the entire packet. You can even uh, omit this one. Um, so this is what a transmitter block diagram now looks like. Um, we have our input bits, then we have a forward error correction with um, an interleaver to combat um, burst errors, which is, especially in the 2.4 gigahertz band, pretty uh, probable or likely. Then we have our FDDSM, which I just discussed. Um, and at this point, we get uh, those space-time block code matrices, which are then demultiplexed in the sense that we separate the actual antenna information, so which antenna the uh, symbols are supposed to trans be transmitted from, from the symbols, which are then upsampled and um, spread with a gold code of a certain length. And then there's, again, something special. You could say we add some zeros. But CB st uh, stands for zero padding. Why do we do that? That actually tackles a very crucial issue with spatial modulation systems. If you go into the literature and look at any paper on spatial modulation, they will almost surely claim in the first two sentences that their modulation scheme can make do with a single RF chain. Thing is, if you actually wanted to implement that, which probably nobody ever did, you realize that, um, or at least very seldom, um, you realize that you need some pulse shaping. And those pulses will always extend this one symbol time if you, uh, if you don't want a sync spectrum or something like that. Um, and therefore, in high-rate spatial modulation systems, it's virtually um, impossible to make do with a single RF chain. If you now go to our very specific case of spatial modulation, where we have a very low-rate signal, so they're all the top, maybe 1,024 chips are transmitted from the same um, antenna before we switch. It doesn't really hurt if I like add 10 zeros at the end or something like that. But what I get is that after pulse shaping, I have really uh, separated pulses in time, so I can switch between the antennas without spectral broadening. And that is what's, what's done here based on the antenna information that was extracted in front here. But let's think about a receiver and how that one has to look like. Um, first of all, we assume that sensors use unslotted or lower. That is, pr that is pretty optimal in terms of energy usage for the sensor because it just wakes up, transmits, and goes back to sleep. But for the base stations, that actually means that you have no idea when the packet is going to arrive. Then it's DSSS. Receive power is usually far below thermal noise, like 20 dB below. So you have no easy way of um, detecting packets. And also what makes it even worse is that frames are long, they're uncoordinated, so they may overlap at the receiver. That's not really a problem because it's the DSSS, but your receiver has to account for that. Um, and therefore, our synchronization approach was basically brute force. So we had to assume that any or every incoming sample is the potential beginning of a packet, um, meaning we correlated with our known preamble after demodulation and apply the threshold to that. This here is the autocorrelation function of our preamble, which is 32 bits long. And you can already see that there is considerable side lobes, but it's pretty short. You won't get much better than that, probably. Um, next is... Low-cost devices means low-cost oscillators means frequency offset. Again, you don't know the frequency offset. So basically, we had to span up a filter bank with uh, frequency trans translated versions of our input signal so we can actually just try different frequency hypotheses. Um, and last but not least, also due to the long frames, we really get issues with clock drift because we have, at maximum spreading factor, we can create frames that are like four and a half seconds long and so it can happen that the initial timing synchronization is not enough and we have to implement the delay lock loop or something like that to stay in sync. So this is what a receiver block diagram actually looks like. Um, this is for a single frequency hypothesis to, make, to not make it more complicated than necessary. Um, so we do not consider frequency offset at this point. This is the signal that's coming in. It's correlated with the preamble spreading sequence, which is different from the data spreading sequence. And then we have a block that um, separates the correlated signal in all its polyphases based on the length of, uh, of a symbol, meaning we have about two times the length of the spreading factor 
times the oversampling rate polyphases here. So we really quickly hit 1,000 here. So there's a lot of branches here. On every branch, which is then basically critically sampled, um, we demodulate to soft bits, correlate with our known preamble, and then apply a threshold. And if the threshold is exceeded, we can add a start of packet tag to that. If we now test different frequency hypotheses, we basically duplicate this here again and, and again and again. Um, and we also attach the information on which branch, so on which frequency hypothesis we detected the packet. So the original stream, which is now marked with SOP packets, if, uh, pre, um, if yeah, packets were present, now go into the frame demultiplexer, which takes care of the overlapping frames. As soon as a SOP tag, it, uh, tag is detected, we basically allocate a temporary buffer, despread the incoming signal, and put those symbols into the buffer until the entire frame has been received. And then it's basically passed on to the actual demodulation, where we again um, calculate soft bits, deinterleave, convolutionally decode with our Viterbi, and check the CRC. And if that one passes, we can pass the packet to the upper layer. This here is actually a pretty generic DSSS receiver. This here, so our special demodulation has been kernelized, so basically you could just drop in another kernel and you could, could do regular DSSS. Um, so this is what it looks like over the air. So what you can see here is the output of our preamble correlation here in red. Um, so this is the actual over the air uh, signal. Um, which has been interleaved again, so we get a continuous time signal. Then we have the um, threshold here in blue, which is basically used to control the false alarm rate. So we mo um, the threshold is based on the output of the preamble correlation, not directly on the input signal. Um, and if you uh, put like white noise into our correlation, there's again a Ga Gaussian signal coming out, and you can like define a, that your threshold is like two or three or five sigma um, out, so you can uh, yeah, control the false alarm rate. Because that's really important, because we get, as I said, considerable side lobes here, and you can see that there's a few spikes coming up here, actually, that cross this lower line, but are still below the higher one. Now you might ask, why, why, looks, why does this look so strange? Why is this so peaky? Um, the thing is, the threshold is calculated on a um, per polyphase basis. That means the polyphase, which actually coincides with, uh, with our uh, signal uh, timing or offset, um, carries a much higher energy because there's um, the non-perfect uh, the, the non uh, autocorrelation of uh, the preamble, and therefore, the, the, the threshold goes higher for that polyphase components. But as I said, that's actually pretty cool because it also suppresses our side lobes, while the other polyphase components get a much more sensitive threshold. Um, and therefore, if there was a, a second frame, for instance, um, on a different polyphase component, we have more sensitivity to actually uh, detect that. And you can see that the frame here has been detected. There's actually four detections which corresponds to the oversampling rate of four we usually use. Okay. We also tried that entire thing over um, the air to see how close we come to simulation performance. So we did that at 2.4 gigahertz. The bandwidth is one mega chip per second, so roughly uh, one megahertz with a spreading factor of 256, which still runs in real time. If you go much higher, it's at some point it becomes uh, complicated, but 256 actually runs on my regular laptop um, with a 16-byte payload, 4-byte preamble, and the threshold here, th that is what I meant. With this sigma factor, you actually control like the false alarm rate, but you have, there's some trade-off um, with misdetection, obviously. And off this means that's a simulation where we have perfect synchronization. Yeah, we did it with user B210s. Those were actually connected with a, um, over an octoclock because we didn't have the frequency synchronization in place back then. Um, yeah, so they had actually shared clock, but of course no timing synchronization. Um, so what are the important lines here? The black one, which is dashed, is actually the AWGN simulation we did in uh, Gun Radio, while the solid curves 
are the ones that we actually measured. And you can see that we get uh, like a very low error rate if we cross seven or eight EB, uh, DB, EB over N0, and our loss is actually pretty low. Um, yeah, so we're actually quite happy with that result. Um, also, this says EB uh, over N0, but just remind yourself, if this, if this was SNR, this was about minus 14 or so. So this is really, really low SNR. You never see anything in a, in a waterfall plot or something like that. So you really have to do this brute force approach for synchronization. Okay, so I already come to my summary. Um, I showed you how we implemented our sparse waveform in GNU Radio and an experimental testbed. We uh, used a polyphase synchronization algorithm for the timing um, with an adapter threshold. We ver verified it over the air, which, and it works pretty well, actually, and the code is, as always, public, and you can just download it on our GitHub page. In the future, I'd really like to further optimize this so I can go to even higher spreading rates, be, uh, because that's actually where you want to go. Um, there's already a ton of Volk in, in that, but I'm sure something can be optimized, maybe even algorithmically. Um, and what I'm also really interested in, but I'm not sure if I find time for that is, but maybe I find a student for that, <laughs> is um, I'd like to use the FPGA for the synchronization part or GPU or whatever, just to, because if you saw this uh, structure, it's highly parallel. And that would be just awesome to push it through the FPGA and just get an annotated uh, sample stream out of that. Um, and then just do the actual demodulation on the host. And as I said in the beginning, um, we get this uh, transmit diversity order of two for independent channels. Who knows if those channels that we actually encounter are actually independent? And therefore, I'm also right now having students doing a lot of measurements for long range 2.4 gigahertz channels in urban environments to see um, if we can get some results for correlation between channels and then make like realistic claims about how much we're going to gain uh, compared to a SISO scheme. Okay, so that is pretty much all I have. That is my obligatory uh, GSC flow graph, which is actually the one for the uh, receiver, but yeah, the block diagram is easier to explain. So I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be really happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Felix. We do have time for questions, if there's anyone in the audience that would like to ask something. No? Okay. Well, you blew everybody away. Okay. Uh, I do want to take the opportunity to say that uh, uh, this year Felix organized uh, GSOC for the Green Radio organization, which takes a lot more work than you might think. Uh, Google is fantastic, but it, is, uh, it can be labor intensive to run an effort like GSOC. Uh, so I do want to thank, thank you, Felix, for taking that on. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Matt.